the strength and the character of any guerrilla army is to be found in the caliber of the men and women who make it up. And the caliber of IRA volunteers is extraordinary. It doesn't depict heroes. What it says to me is there was blood spilled on that spot. They were prepared to put their lives on the line in pursuit of that noble cause. They seem to be markers indicating who, who, who's saying, who's in control of the territory. Friends, brothers and sisters, families of our Republican heroes and our Republican heroines, thank you all for being right. Each year, thousands of tourists visit Balik, the tiny village on the Fermanagh border with Donegal. They come to the pottery, where the fine Parian china that has made the name of the town world famous is made. It's an important draw for visitors to Northern Ireland, particularly Americans. The white porcelain pieces produced here are reminiscent of another era, a homely, romantic, peaceful one. But directly opposite the tourist office sits a new, controversial attraction that offers the visitor a very different picture. It's a provisional IRA memorial. Yet the carved stone on the roadside, evoking an era of glorious blood sacrifice by dedicated freedom fighters, is in many ways as idealized as the basket weave fruit bowls and vases produced across the river. We owe it to both our parents' memory to have this wrong put right. Because this, uh, this to us is the ultimate insult. Um, what Sinn Féin and IRA have done is they have uh, in trying to honour their dead, they have dishonoured ours in the most callous way. As far as IRA monuments go, this one at Slater's Cross in Balik is by no means the most provocative in design. A cross and dove, symbols of Christianity and peace, replace the more traditional crossed armalites, symbols of war. But it's the sighting of this memorial to three IRA men killed on active service during the Troubles only yards from the spot where the provisionals gunned down two Protestant workmen in a hail of bullets that makes this one of the most controversial monuments in years. Tonight, Insight reveals the deep hurt felt by victims of IRA violence in this area, and we examine whether the sighting of this monument is part of a wider Sinn Féin strategy, not just to glorify IRA actions of the past, but to obliterate the memory of their victims. My father worked, uh, he was a joiner and a building contractor. He knew quite a lot of people, business people and ordinary folk around the Billy area. And I don't think you'll find one person who could say a wrong word about him. He was, um, tried to do as much as he could for the general public. If he could help them out in any way, definitely he would have done it. William Hazard was driving home from work with his employee and lifelong friend, Fred Love, when the attack happened in August 1988. The father of four had recently celebrated his 60th birthday, something his unmarried workmate Fred had done four years earlier. As he pulled up at the Slater's Cross Junction, he was met by four gunmen with automatic rifles. Horrified witnesses watched as the attackers pumped more than 100 high-velocity bullets into the white Peugeot van. The killers had the magazines of their guns doubled up. As the first emptied, they simply flipped them over and continued firing. The two Protestant workmen didn't stand a chance. They were the latest victims of the IRA campaign, deemed legitimate targets because they had been working on the local RUC station. I heard a car and I looked out at the back and I saw my uncle coming up to the house and just the way he was set, uh, said there was something wrong. And as soon as he came in and he was shaking, um, he went to my mother and the rest of it unfolded after that and it was just utter shock and disbelief at what had happened. We just, um, you know, it, it really was a nightmare. The nightmare for us began then. Mm -hmm. We had bought him some jumpers for his birthday, and I think one thing that really hurt most is that he was wearing one of his uh, jumpers on the day that he was murdered. There he was, you know, in his birthday jumper, just riddled to bits. 
And I just thought, you know, the people that, uh, that murdered him didn't know him. He was our dad. They didn't know what he meant to us. Marina was left to take charge of the family business, something she continued to do until after her mother's death last year. We lived uh, where the family business operated from, which meant that we had quite a few workshops as well. Mum never uh, really liked us to touch anything. She wanted everything sort of left the way it was, and we respected that wish. And, um, but when she passed away, uh, we just couldn't see any way that we could logically keep the place on. So um, it was with great sadness that we had to sell the place within this last six months. But just at the point when the family were beginning to move on, the placing of the monument has reopened old wounds that were only beginning to heal. Fourteen years ago we had this, you know, a threat by, by the murder of our father, but this is another threat to, to our particular family again. It's something that I don't think, you know, any, any family should be going through. Not once, but twice now, and grief renewed again with, with all this happening with the monument being erected. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a very thoughtless act. The three names on the monument are IRA men who died in two different incidents in Fermanagh. Joe McManus was shot dead while attempting to ambush a dog warden and part-time UDR man at an isolated farmhouse near Cash. His father is the Sinn Féin candidate for Sligo Leitrim in the Republic's general election. Anton Magilla Breach and Kieran Fleming were part of a five-strong IRA unit who were ambushed by the SAS while attempting to place a bomb on a road linking the Cash to Pedigo and Cash to Balik roads. Anton Magilla Breach was shot dead at the scene while Kieran Fleming drowned while trying to make his escape across the Banner River into Donegal. The fact that none of the men died in Balik or came from Balik has led the Hazard family and many others to conclude that the sighting of the memorial at Slater's Cross is a deliberate provocation. Well, the reason the monument has been cited for this is that it will be on a, a place of public ground where people travelling to from Fermanagh to Sligo to Donegal or further afield will see for themselves the memory that has been kept of the Republican people who died for a cause that we all aspire to. It is not there in, in any way to give offence. It was not intended to give offence and was other people who brought the offence to it. The family say, regardless of whether you intended to cause offence or not, it has caused offence, and that's where they want to move on from. That's correct. That's Do you recognise that? Oh, we, yep, we, we recognise that it has caused offence to the Hazard family by all means. We have, like, I knew, I myself personally knew Willie Hazard and Fred Love very well, better than any of the people who were talking about him. I walked with him because I walk in the building today as well, and knew Willie Hazard very well. And he wasn't, if, let's get things straight, Willie Hazard did not die at that particular spot. He, it was a couple of hundred yards way up the road from that there. For the first time, Marina and Karen agreed to visit the site of the monument, walking the route that 14 years earlier was their father's final journey. As we're approaching the spot, I see now where the monument is, and it's just right on the junction uh, where my dad was shot. As he was coming up into this spot, just the way this car is coming down, actually. Basically, he was slowing down here, and as he was slowing down, a vehicle actually overtook him. It was part of the ambush plot. So I would say just about here it happened. So there it is, yards away yeah, from where our father. Sure, 125 sure. yards. Yeah. Or well, it's right. not 125 mm -hmm. yards. Mm -hmm. It was put up without any planning permission. They didn't seek any planning permission. They've broke the law in doing that. They've also put it up, as I say, to three men who was who were out to murder. So they're honouring three murderers. And uh, we didn't get any notice of it being put up. <laughs> And uh, it's just a shock. It really is quite emotional. I just feel quite emotional the fact that I'm here now and having to look over at that. That to me is the IRA trying to put their stamp on this village. We just feel like it's just like a sort of a showpiece for them. The Hazard family took their case to Fermanagh District Council last month in an effort to have the monument recited, winning support from the SCLP. We have a problem here, and it's a problem because. This monument is on a, the site, on the very place where two Protestant workmen were killed uh, and uh, the three uh, people, uh, the three Republicans named on the monument uh, were killed many miles from here. Uh, we're moving into a post-conflict situation and I think we should be able to commemorate those who have lost their lives without giving hurt or offence to anybody else. 
sinn fein's strength on the council has meant efforts to resolve the issue at a local level have so far been in vain not only does sinn fein justify the placing of the monument near the site of an ira double killing but its local representatives continue to justify the killing itself well the only of it is this that both the, the set of people died in the court of ireland first of all fred love and william hauser died putting together a barracks to house the enemy of the people of ireland and the other people who died died to remove the enemy of ireland and that is for the and it is two different countries but both died on the cause of ireland one trying to keep the british soldiers on ireland the other trying to remove them from ireland but the distinction as far as the family would see it and probably many other people is that they were simply builders doing the day's work are you saying that the people that killed them were simply doing they de their day's work that's as well right. that's correct right. that's what an army's for such sentiments have stirred up bitter memories, not just for the Hazard and Love families, but for the wider Unionist community in Fermanagh. It, it's a disgrace to me that, that people and fellow countrymen of mine would actually describe their own citizens, their own neighbours, as being legitimate targets. That is absolutely ridiculous, and you know that shows the type of murderous campaign, the type of mindset of these people, to actually suggest that their own neighbours that their own supposedly friends were actually legitimate targets. I, I treat this with total contempt. Because Unionists have always been a minority along the border in Fermanagh, the IRA campaign throughout the Troubles fostered a sense of fear and isolation and bred deep mistrust between the outnumbered Protestants and their Catholic neighbours. Many of the victims, though deemed legitimate by the IRA, were soft targets. Protestants with tentative links to the security forces, often not current members, who lived or worked along the border. Typified by killings such as that of farmer Ronnie Funston. My family lived in a farm near Pettigo, and um, my parents lived there, and myself and Ronnie and my other brothers and sisters had moved away. And on the 13th of March 1984, IRA terrorists came along and murdered my brother. He was on the tractor feeding his cattle at 8 o'clock in the morning they shot him in the back. Um, my mother came along and um, she witnessed the terrorists running across the fields across the border. How close to the border were you? I'd say about less than a quarter of a mile. So it was an easy escape route for the terrorists to come. He was the lifeline of the family. I was still at school. My parents were elderly. My father especially had retired from farming and my brother worked the family farm. And what happened uh, following your brother's murder? Well, my mother tried to continue for a couple of years with hired help. My other brothers and sisters had other careers, so they were elsewhere. And after a while, she realised she just couldn't do it any longer. Why did they target one? Well, their excuse at the time was because he had been a past member of the, of the UDR. He had left it some eight years before that. To me, to me and my family, that was an excuse because we believed it was just because he was a Protestant living in an isolated farm and it was a way of removing us from that farm. Joy's rector, Reverend Brian Kerr, has around 300 members in his parish, yet it stretches right across the West Fermanagh border on both sides, covering an area greater than Belfast. Despite their small number, he says his parishioners feel relations with their Catholic neighbours are generally very good and that the sighting of the monument in Belique is contrary to the mood in the community. Yeah, it's portraying an image of Belique that isn't really there. It, it's not true for the majority of people. It's uh, portraying a community indeed, aside from any political consideration, a community where murder is celebrated and honoured. And uh, I don't think that's the kind of image the vast majority of people in Belique would wish to have for their village. He feels the sighting of the memorial must be opposed, for it gives offence to so many, not least his own parishioners, including Audrey, the youngest of the Hazard family. Incredibly deeply felt by the family, particularly for Audrey, but uh, th this is uh, right in the heart of her nearest village. Uh, she would have to pass it on the way to, to this, the local school, the local health centre, the local shops and amenities. Uh, she especially has to live with that, uh, the knowledge that that's there, uh, day in, day out. Uh, and for the, the wider community also, the, the, the greater number of my parishioners, uh, there, there's a great feeling of disgust. 
I've had to, to, to reroute myself and go a different way to avoid the monument. This is the, the way now I'm going to try and change my route. So you have to take a right turn and yes, get this small road? Yes, I have to road. go this, this um, small road over a wee bridge to get to the lake. Is it that far that you really can't face driving past it? Yes, I've only I've only went to see it once, and um, that was enough for me. I really didn't wish to, to see it again. It was uh, stressful enough seeing it once. For the Hazard family and others, the message behind the monument sighting is clear. They're trying to to turn the whole thing on its head. They're glorifying the Republican cause at every opportunity, and in every way that they can. Um, they've now got quite a grip on power in the west of the province and rather than actually using that constructively and trying to build bridges with their unionist neighbours, they are now setting about marginalising people of a Protestant and unionist background and they're making us feel very, very uncomfortable. The monument at Slater's Cross is the second controversial stone to be erected in this area in the last year. In the summer, Residents in Garrison awoke to find a roadside tribute to their former MP, hunger striker Bobby Sands. It, it certainly would make my parishioners think that there is some kind of strategy going on. Uh, first Garrison, now Balik, uh, where will be next? And, uh, and again, the, 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 the monument in Garrison caused a, a great hurt and uh, a great deal of puzzlement. They, they were wondering its particular relevance to the village of Garrison. Um, in the main, they haven't been provoked in the same way. This monument to Bleak takes the whole thing up to another level. It's more directly personal. Uh, it touches upon the lives of families within this area in a more direct way. It was Garrison last year, it was Bleak this year, and it'll be some other time next year, and it will go on, unless it's stopped. Unionist politicians portray the monuments as an attempt by Sinn Féin and the IRA to finish by other means what they failed to achieve through the armed struggle. Well, I have no doubt that what uh, the IRA are about in erecting these memorials is not just about commemoration. It is also about intimidation. It's about marking out territory. Having removed 80,000 Protestants from uh, the west of the province and in what Martin McGuinness described as the greening of the west, they're now erecting these memorials as a kind of totem to say, we're the IRA, we control these areas. But Sinn Féin denies any central control. There is certainly no grand plan uh, from Sinn Féin's point of view that, you know, we go around the countryside setting up memorials and doing all these sorts of things. There's no grand plan there at all. People in their areas will seek to commemorate in a way which they believe is fitting. Nevertheless, Honouring the Republican dead and by extension glorifying the deeds they have done seems to be top of the Sinn Féin agenda at present. At the recent commemorative event in Dublin, entitled Tia Gra, meaning love of country, over two and a half thousand relatives of more than 350 IRA members killed throughout the Troubles heard Gerry Adams pay tribute to their loved ones. Each family went home with a book and a bronze lily to commemorate the sacrifice to the cause made by their own. Jerry Adams made a passing comment about reaching out to unionists, but seemed to care little for the anger his speech was certain to arouse. The IRA existed cheek by jowl with the British forces, with all their massive technical and financial resources, as well as a compliant legal and judicial system and a battery of repressive laws. And despite all of this, the forces of the British Crown failed and they failed because of you. They failed to defeat the army because they failed to defeat you. This was a purely internal Republican function. Uh, it, it's for Republican consumption. Uh, I deliberately paying no attention to anyone else outside. Um, looking at the IRA dead and trying to, if you like, settle the whole issue within the Republican movement, as I say, paying no attention to what anyone outside the Republican movement might think about what has happened. It's in the human condition, and particularly in the Irish context, though this is also universal, that armed aggression is met with armed resistance, particularly and especially when there is no alternative. 
That is what the IRA was about. But to fellow nationalists who opposed violence, Jerry Adams' speech was nothing more than an extended apology for murder. I don't accept now, nor did I accept then, that there was no alternative. We did have the ballot box. We, did, we, we were entitled to vote. Remember, there were people who, who tore up ballot papers in those days and who didn't accept that the democratic process was the way forward. I'm delighted now that those people accept that, yes, politics is the way forward. Among the audience at Tear Gra was Kieran Leonard from Dona, a Republican stronghold in Fermanagh. His brother Louis was an IRA man and butcher in Derry Lynn, murdered in 1972 by elements widely believed to be connected to the British Army. He defends Tear Gra as a necessary and fitting event for families of Republican dead. It was a very emotional event. It was very um, private and dignified, very sad and very honourable event. Um, sad because nobody really wanted to be there, because nobody wanted to have a loved one dead. Um, dignified in the way that it was done, it wasn't done in any um, triumphalist way. The controversy surrounding Tiagra, however, is that the version of history presented by Gerry Adams is one accepted only by Republicans. Well, the IRA are into revisionism. They want to revise the history of the last 30 years so that they emerge as freedom fighters, heroes, um, and that their analysis of the situation was the right analysis. Well, it wasn't. The IRA were wrong. What they did was morally wrong and was morally indefensible. They were engaged in murder and destruction. They murdered more Roman Catholics than the loyalist paramilitaries uh, did in the last 30 years. Um, is that something they want to glorify in? If people want closure, that's fine. And I, have, I, I think it's right that people should acknowledge, uh, to the loved ones particularly, uh, make an acknowledgement of what they have suffered in losing uh, their own loved ones. But what I do object to is when, in doing that, they glorify the deeds of those who made victims of others. That is not acceptable. It is revisionism. It is to say that those who killed, that some of the victims who were killed were killed by people who were working in a noble cause and did glorious deeds. I mean, I'm not in the least bit interested in a debate with the SDLP on the question of armed struggle, because that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's gone, that's part of, of our history. An interesting admission, perhaps, for as remembering the dead of any war as the Tear Gra event was presented, not something that is only done when the war is over, as suggested by some commentators. This is almost like handing out campaign medals, that it's over, the campaign has happened. You're hardly going to hand out these plaques, these trophies to the families, uh, these commemorative, little, little commemorative things, if the campaign was going to be continuing, if there would be more dead. I mean, this really is in many ways a signal that the campaign is over. Their unique interpretation of events is not something that bothers Republicans. It is their defining characteristic. In time, they believe their provisional history will in fact become official history. History will judge, to, you know, the outcome of it will judge which was right and which was wrong. I mean, these have been very turbulent times and very emotional times and ordinary people have been thrown into uh, extraordinary events. Um, and different people have taken different sides on issues. So I think we have to wait to the, the full case of history is told yet to, to judge who's right or who's wrong. Jerry Adams' speech may have been aimed at an internal audience. So too might the monuments in Belique and Garrison be designed solely for sympathizers. But the reality is their message is also received by a wider community whose experience of republicanism is one of suffering, intimidation and pain. Well, their right is completely wrong in our books. We, we just want to le lead a normal life and we're doing well, um, doing, doing what we were doing without having any actions being forced upon us on, as happened 14 years ago, where our life was just totally turned around and shattered by events that were happened because of the IRA, who, as Jerry Adams calls, are right, but we certainly do not think they're right. The benign interpretation is that the ever-growing number of monuments 
memorials and commemorations are all part of a Republican strategy that spells the death of the IRA as an active organization. But it's a strategy that's as dangerous as it is hurtful to their victims. For the real fear remains that in glorifying armed struggle in the past, the way remains open for it to resume in the future, leaving many to question whether the end of the IRA is ever something that will be carved in stone.